I am here to introduce Christina Reyes. How do you say it? Is it Reyes? Reyes. Mm -hmm. Reyes, okay. Christina it works at the Orem Library. And I have here that you work as the technical services. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm an associate librarian in tech services. Okay. And Christina is going is uh, going to pre present on developing inclusive attitude competencies and implicit bias awareness. And Katie Wagner is also here to help Christina and help everything go smoothly. Um, and also Marissa Bischoff is our tech person. She's waving at you. Um, I'm really excited about this very timely subject and um, just really eager to hear what Christina has to tell us today. So I will turn the time over to you, Christina. Well, I am very excited to be um, presenting to you guys. Um, I know it is a very important subject, a little bit serious given the current circumstances that we're living through now. Um, but hopefully we can still have fun with it and um, learn something in the process. So um, again, I am an associate librarian at the Orem Public Library. I am also the vice chair of ULA's Diversity Services Roundtable. Um, I am, again, happy to have this opportunity to discuss implicit bias, how we as librarians can recognize bias in ourselves and work to correct them so that we can provide the best service to our patrons. Um, a lot of you may wonder why is it important to have this conversation? Well, the ACRL in their article, Keeping Up With Implicit Bias, it states that the implicit bias we librarians have can negatively impact virtually all aspects of library operations if we do not take meaningful action to correct it. <clears throat> Unacknowledged bias um, saps, so sorry, saps librarian morale and effectiveness, as well as discourages patrons from engaging with reference services. Implicit bias impedes the services li libraries offer to patrons. The key to providing meaningful, meaningful reference services is to make patrons comfortable enough to share their research problems with a reference librarian. Minority patrons may not reach this level of comfort if a library's environment implicitly communicates majority culture. For example, students of color do not always feel fully welcome in a law school library where most of the students, most of the faculty, and all, the port all of the portraits on the walls are white of white people. <laughs> it is incumbent upon librarians to actively create inclusive spaces given the whiteness of libraries' cult traditional culture in order to be welcoming to all patrons. Patron patrons who do not feel a sense of inclusion in a library setting will not seek out the assistance they need. To assist users most effectively, librarians need to be aware of our individual and institutional implicit biases and take the necessary steps to minimize the effects of those biases. Are you familiar with the library, um, American Library Association's Code of Ethics, where the first section states that we librarians provide the highest level of service to all library users through appropriate and useful organized resources, equitable service policies, equitable access, and accurate, unbiased, and courteous responses to all requests. Additionally, Section 5 of ALA's Bill of Rights states that a person's right to use the library should not be denied or abridged because of origin, age, background, or abuse. We need to not only understand, but also demonstrate with our actions that here in Utah, our libraries are committed to serve all of our community members equally and provide the resources that meet their specific needs. The people that we serve are complex individuals with many different diverse identities. In other words, we are all diverse even within the social groups that make us diverse. For example, you can have a black identifying, gender non-conforming, English as a second language, 
visually impaired patron, a diverse patron indeed, <laughs> with many intersections, but focusing on the individual, respecting what makes, what makes them diverse, but not boxing them into one stereotype or another is how we are going to further align ourselves with the core values of librarianship and provide better services to our users. There are a lot of challenges when it comes to equity, diversity, and inclusion. During this session, you will notice that most of my examples are of racial unconscious bias. Having experienced and still experiencing for some people what NPR called the summer of racial reckoning, it, seem, it just seemed appropriate for us to use race in our examples. By us, I mean me. <laughs> So after this session, I would like each of you to walk away or go away <laughs> with an understanding of microaggressions and implicit bias or unconscious bias. I would like for you guys to start thinking about um, your own implicit biases, taking time to gauge your intersectionality. Think about the results of your self-assessment. Take steps to put into action some of the ideas for taking, some of the ideas for developing habits that combat implicit bias. Our first section is understanding your implicit bias slash gauging your intersectionality. Intersections are the social groups that make up our identity. We are often the groups that we surround ourselves with. For example, some of us are part of the um, disabled or handicapped persons community. Uh, community. Um, there's people in the homeless community, immigrant community. Um, there's an incarcerated population. That in itself is a community the LGBTQ plus or pride community, um, senior citizens, elderly, that's a community, um, ethnic minority um, can form a community. These are all different intersections or social groups. Um, with intersectionality, Merriam-Webster dictionary defines it as the complex cumulative way in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination, such as racism, sexism, classism, uh, combine, overlap, or intersect, especially in the experiences of marginalized individuals or groups. This concept of intersectionality as we're using it today um, was first developed in 1989 by American lawyer and law professor, Kimberly Williams Crenshaw it serves as a framework for understanding how a person's unique identities, for example, gender, sex, race, religion, ability, etc., leaves them open to forms of discrimination or in some cases, privilege. Um, in order to make this session a little bit interactive, if you guys would like to share in the chat, only if you feel comfortable, take two to three minutes to think about what your intersections are. Using the beginning of a sentence, I am a, go ahead and list out your intersections. If you feel comfortable, share it in the chat with us. Um, examples include racial identity, class, gender identity, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, or others like socioeconomic status, um, age demographic, the age range within, I like to say that my intersection um, is I am a cis um, woman who's black identifying and Hispanic and middle class and what's another one? Oh, and the age demographic zero to 50. <laughs> um, also, while you're taking a few minutes to answer that, I would like you to think about, um, are there certain groups that you have limited or no interactions with? Um, for example, 
a religious affiliation. Maybe you have little to no interactions with persons of other religious affiliation. Um, when it comes to sexual orientation, maybe you have little to no interactions with pe persons from other sexual orientation. Uh, when it comes to racial identity, maybe you have little to no interaction with persons of other race identities or ethnic identities. Um, these are good things to think about and you can also list that out on your own. Um, for example, I mean, do has someone had interaction with a Muslim woman who is trans and under 25? <laughs> uh, in the workplace, do most people that you work with belong to the same group? That's a good thing to think about. Ask yourself, when I go to work, do I work with people who belong to the same group as me? Um, that's also important for you to ask yourself. Do we have anything in the chat people would like to share? Sorry, let me unmute myself and I'll share a few of these. All right. Um, so I'm saying I am agnostic. I am a white woman. I'm a single mom. I'm an arrow race, a gender person. I'm a white mid fifties, middle class, cis female mother who is questioning all organized religions, but was raised in a Midwestern Lutheran church. All right. Awesome. Thanks for sharing, everyone. I love it. Thank you, guys. Let's move along. Section two, microaggressions and implicit bias. Defining implicit bias. The Kerwin Institute at Ohio State University defines implicit bias as the attitude and stereotypes that affect our actions decisions and unconscious understanding towards or against a particular person or group. A person may endorse certain values and believe those values to be true, yet at the same time, um, the same person may also have an unconscious bias that does not align with their declared values. A common example is favoring familiar sounding names than those, um, than those from other cultural groups. It's always easy for us to um, to say, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm just gonna go ahead and and you know, pick on the student that has a name that that sounds similar or sounds like something I've heard before, and maybe not call out on a student or a person in the group that has a name that is hard to pronounce. Um, we don't like to find ourselves in these uncomfortable situations, um, but that in itself is you're letting um, you're you're letting a bias that you have um, turn into a microaggression. When a teacher is in a classroom or um, a, a you know a group of, of coworkers are in a employee meeting and we want to hear from everyone, or you want to um, acknowledge that people have their hands raised and they want to be called on to participate. Um, sometimes we can't tell that we go, we lean towards or we favor those with familiar sounding names, um, excluding or leaving off to the side those that may have a more ethnic or, um, or a name that's closely related to their cultural group and not so quote unquote mainstream. And, and again, that's isolating and a form of microaggression. And microaggressions are indirect and subtle acts of discrimination. They can be intentional or unintentional. Microaggressions are based on different intersections that make up a person's identity, like race, gender, sexual orientation, etc., and often occur through passive remarks and actions. Um, me, <laughs> myself, <laughs> um, have been a recipient of so many microaggressions. And for most of my life, I did not have the language. I did not know that what was kind of um, 
chipping away at my self-confidence and what was um, affecting me in this very real way and lasting way was a microaggression, that there was a term for that. So if me, who is the recipient, the one that's living this chronic kind of, um, you know, disadvantage, I guess, this issue throughout most of my life, I can imagine there's so many people who um, are the perpetrators of the microaggression that have no idea that that's what they're doing, right? Um, this is why, you know, there's so many of us here now sitting at this um, session trying to understand, trying to learn that maybe some of the things that we do can at the moment seem innocent or seem like it's just one isolated in, in incident. Oops, I'm sorry, I didn't know. But we are learning that people throughout their years with time, these things accumulate, accumulate and accumulate and they stack up. And then the distrust in people of other, people of other cultural um, groups or other intersections um, it grows, right? So then we have a big divide. So since I am focusing primarily on race issues between white people who tend to be the majority in most places in our country, um, some major cities, maybe they're not, but in a, in a, especially a special circumstance like Utah, white people tend to be, um, they may not know that tiny little microaggressions are accumulating, accumulating, and um, they chip away and chip away, chip away at a person's confidence and their ability to trust people from the white community. A good example that I like to give is when you are, for example, a school librarian or um, an academic librarian or a public librarian, but you have a young child that um, he comes up to you, he or she comes up to you, and automatically you put them in a category of um, maybe he's son of a son or daughter of an immigrant, or maybe he or she are themselves an immigrant, and then you're complimenting them on their English. Oh, you know, little Julio, you speak such good English, or something similar. Those things are not the first time that little Julio or little Julia has heard. It will not be the only time they will hear it, but as they grow into adolescence and then adulthood, it really has a long lasting and destructive effect. It does not let them reach a point where they can trust and um, connect with people that are the perpetrators of that microaggression. And in this case, it may be a white person. Hopefully I'm making sense, <laughs> but moving along. Um, let's discuss some examples um, of microaggressions. Uh, definitely use the chat for comments and any questions that you may have. I'm going to pause between each example to give you guys a chance to participate. This, um, these scenarios and the, the, the theme scenario message, I adapted this from um, the article, Racial Microaggressions in Everyday Life. I have um, at the end of the presentation resources page and reference pages that you guys can always look these up on your own. I picked three of many, they have many examples in this article um, that I think would be relevant and useful for us to discuss. The first theme, alien in our own land, when a person is assumed to be foreign born. The scenario, asking things like, but no, where are you really from? Or saying things that you may think are a compliment, like you speak good English, or even asking a person to use words in their assumed native language. The message that comes through in these types of scenarios is, you are not American, you are a foreigner. Anyone has had experience with this theme or scenario or microaggression they would like to share, whether as the recipient or the perpetrator, <laughs> even the perpetrator sounds so bad. <laughs> Uh, 
when people have um, found out that I can speak Spanish or that my background is, um, my family is Hispanic, they immediately want me to teach them all the curse words. And I'm like, well, do you have all day or year? Because <laughs> depending on where you are in Latin America, one word can mean, um, one word can be vulgar and, and not be vulgar in another country, another region. Should I move along, Katie? Okay. So the second theme. Um, assigning intelligence to a person on the basis of their race. Scenario. Again, saying things you may think are compliments but are actually destructive, like you are a credit to your people. Or another way it can play out is when a person asks an Asian person to help with a math problem. Um, the message the patron comes away with or the person, the receiver of the microaggression comes away with is, it is unusual for a person of your race to be intelligent or that all Asians are good at math. So you're in a library and um, you have a young patron that comes in, an older patron, any patron comes in, um, they look Asian, they're come, they come to you and they are asking for resources to help them practice for you know, the ACT or the math portion of the GRE or what have you. Um, a, look of, a look of, oh, like you need the, the help or, or saying something, <laughs> oh my gosh, and you would think Asians are good at math or little things like that that may come across as, oh, this is, this is a joke or a little look of surprise like, oh, I wouldn't think you, you'd be looking for this or anything like that. Those, those messages, th th those get translated. People absorb it, people notice, and people take those things to heart. And they do have a destructive effect and they do, um, they do hold us as librarians back from forming a relationship with our patrons and, effective and, and having the ability to effectively um, offer them service. So, moving along. Um, yeah, we had one comment in the chat from Kim, and they say, as part of an interracial marriage with Asian looking children, I'm white, I've been asked multiple times, where did you get them? Oh my. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, not good. <laughs> not good. <laughs> um, well, you got them, you know, straight from heaven, in my opinion. Um, so yeah, those, that's a good example. Thank you for sharing. With the third example that I have here, this is a doozy. So I'm, I'm hoping I get a lot of comments and questions out of this one. It's the theme color blindness or indications that a white person doesn't want to acknowledge race. Um, it can play out like things, uh, someone saying things like, oh, I don't see color. There is only one race, the human race. These can also have damaging effects. The message is, um, the message this time is that you don't see or validate the person's racial or ethnic experiences. With saying things like, there is only one human race, is letting the person know that the dominant culture is the only one that matters. Now bringing it down to us, what is the dominant culture? The white culture. Um, there's many cultures within the white culture, but the American white culture. <laughs> um, the, the, the idea, I'm trying to get a, a an example that probably has happened with me, can't think one off the top of my head, but the idea of saying, oh, you know, I was raised um, to not see color. I, you know, I, I, I treated all my friends the same. I, you know, um, you know, I looked for all my friends the same. It doesn't matter. But then prop, 
in that same in the, with that same thinking let's say that you want to have a gathering of your friends here's a good example you want to have a pool party okay and you want to invite all of your friends including christina this one right here and um i show up to the pool party and i say well do you have a swimming cap that i can use because i forgot mine right i would never forget mine but because i forgot mine um you'll be like well no silly why would you need a swim cap you not seeing color you not understanding me my you know how i live my life how i am as a person me the individual um and just blanketing that everyone can like go to the pool and just run around splashing around the same um that's what co color blindness does now 10 points to the house who can tell me why i would need a sleeping a uh, swimming cap <laughs> um but these kinds of things uh, do have damaging effects okay so in a library setting again there's only one human race um you default to the same white authors same um you can go ahead katie okay thanks we just have a few comments so let me read those um, Valerie said, I adopted African American kids and people always immediately start talking about adoption. It's obvious, I guess, but I knew I had to talk to my kids very early about being adopted and that it's okay because of these microaggressions. And Janine shares, my cousin is adopted from Ethiopia. He was older when adopted and he had a serious issue when some of our relatives saying the whole, I don't see color because it made him feel that he couldn't talk about his friends, experiences, etc. of Ethiopia. And then we have a question from Sylvia. Is there a way to ask a kid what their heritage is without it being a negative thing? Example, a kid that came in was having trouble coming up with the words in English and I was helping him. When his mom came in, I got talking with her and found out they're recently here from Turkey. She gave me a fascinating narrative of how they immigrated here. And now when I see this patron, I feel we have a connection. How would I foster a connection like this? Right. Um, I'm not sure how, how once, the, once you saw that the child was having trouble communicating in English what he needed, then you had the conversation with um, his mother and then you found out they were from Turkey. But if you were able to um, get that information and um, establish um, a, a patron um, librarian relationship, I think you did the right thing. Um, and what I would say, if I had a child come up to me or a person come up to me that's having trouble communicating, and that has happened to me often, um, I usually see people try to struggle with English and I would say, oh, excuse me. Um, so I speak English and I speak Spanish. Do you speak Spanish as well? They'll tell me yes or no, or they'll try to communicate Espanol, no Espanol, or they'll say their language. They'll say Portuguese, no, I speak Portuguese or, you know, French. Um, and then in that case, I would say, oh, okay, so you speak French. I don't speak French, but maybe um, you can write what you need in English. Is Would that help you better? Um, offering other solutions or other ways around it, um, that's one way that you can help kind of with that communication barrier. Now, with asking their ethnicity or their where they come from, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would let the person offer up their life experience you um you say hi you know i am i want to communicate with you um you can say you know what is your what is your first thing well you can offer what you know first you can always say oh um you know i really i really love your top i love that pattern you know i'm from you know, France and in, in France, there's a, um, a designer who uses that pattern a lot in fabric. Like, do you have any connection to France? You can always have conversations. You, tr you can try to form the connection with the child, with the person. Um, 
by using examples from your from yourself from your life you know um i i speak spanish and english would spanish help you a little bit better but you don't want to make assumptions and you don't want to say well where are you from or or oh my gosh i really love that top um you know where did you get that like that's not an american thing those kinds of things really do they really do come across differently. There's a different um, way that, that it can be received. So I would say, don't. You let the person that is of the ethnic um, culture, di the different culture, offer up their, their cultural identity to you. Um, oh, and that gives me another one, you guys. I don't know how much time we have, but um, I have been a person who someone has many someone's but most recently someone was trying to assign to me my cultural identity <laughs> i was explaining to a person that i identify myself as african-american because i was born here in in the united states the only home i've ever known but i am also afro-caribbean because my family is from the caribbean and I grew up also um, with a good understanding of my heritage. And that person um, just wouldn't accept it, would say, no, no. <laughs> you can't call yourself African-American. And I'm like, why not? He's like, no, because your parents aren't from here. And it was quite an interesting exchange. So yeah, so we don't want to do that. We don't not want to do that. <laughs> Is that it, Katie? Moving along. Thank you. It's just a little quote that I have here. Inclusion is not just something you believe or value. It is a set of actions that require knowledge base and practice skills. It takes more than beliefs and good intention. So in our last section here, um, we're going to discuss some actions and habits, um, strategies for correcting behavior and developing inclusive competence some ideas what can we as librarians we as individuals do uh, to kind of combat this implicit bias this this thing this unconscious things because I know we as librarians we want to be inclusive we want to have diversity in our in our libraries um, but sometimes we just don't know right a big question that I come across when I speak to many of my peers is, you know, I just don't know if I'm being, if I'm being biased, like how would I know? And I found myself saying it over and over again. And I've definitely found in, in, in the research that to kind of affirm what I've already been saying, that if you don't expose yourself to different kinds of people, to different types of lives, you won't then know what you, what your biases are. A person that has lived in a very, we like to use the word sheltered environment, very homogenous environment, if that person doesn't seek out other cultures, other um, narratives of, of living, other lives, um, that person will not be aware of their biases or of kind of how they can box people up into different stereotypes. Now, relying on TV, not good. Just telling me, oh, Christina, I'm good. I've seen The Wire. No, <laughs> that is not you understanding other people. Um, and the media, unfortunately, can have um, just disastrous effects <laughs> on, on, on our... Um, biases towards uh, people of other communities. So some ideas for libraries. I've gotten these from all over the place, but these are the ones that I think Utah would be super, um, would be beneficial for us in Utah. One is reflect your community. Recently, um, I've had a talk at, at, in my library where I was surprised to find out that quite a few people didn't um, have a deep a meaningful understanding of all of the tribal nations that call Utah home, that have not only called Utah home in the past, but that still currently call Utah home. 
we have eight recognized by the state of Utah tribal nations. And whether you have only a one family in your community or you have a hundred families in your community, you should be reflecting all the people as much as you can um, in your libraries through many different things. You showcase the literature and not just like, oh, um, it's Black History Month, I'm gonna put a book about Booker T. Washington, Martin Luther King, and Michael Jordan, the greatest basketball ever, player ever. No, real stories, real people. Um, so, so that me as a Hispanic, when I walk into your library, I say, oh my gosh, they have signage in Spanish. Even if I speak perfectly good English, that makes me feel welcome. Um, I am a person of Asian descent. I am Pacific Islander. I see the colors, you know, that are, um, are, are colors of, of luck or colors of just positive um, ideas or things like that. And I'm like, okay, you know, we, you know, they have um, the yellow and green that Brazilians love or, <laughs> or they have a book display about um, interesting photos from Carnival or, or things like that. Things that say, we welcome you here and we want you here and we want you to see yourself here in this environment. Um, you combat bi biases with collection development, like I said, showcasing the literature. Um, you ask yourself, for the community that um, I serve, how can I build up my collection so that I can expand their horizons, expand their circle? Um, if you tell me, Christina, I'm a small little rural library in, you know, little town name here, Utah. Um, we just don't have people from all over. Well, that's okay because an hour or two away, you do have cities that have diversity. Utah is going to continue to grow even more and more diversity, thankfully. And, um, and you can, you know, without judgment, without being judgmental, you can try to expand the horizons of the, your community that you do have, right? There are many cultures even within the white community that you can use as a jumping off point. Um, this is, um, this is a holiday that they celebrate in Poland, or it's National Children's Day um, in Finland, and then it's National National Children's Day in Japan, and you create a display, you know, for children with primarily Japanese um, kids um, that are the main subjects of the story. Um, you can just there's so many ways that you can go, and there's so many places that you can go with. Um, collection development. Another thing with collection development, you can think about what groups are being underrepresented in your collection. Uh, um, do you have enough um, uh, LGBTQ plus books? Do you have, um, again, books about kids who um, move to other countries? Uh, do you have books about kids who have different kinds of family units? Do you have books about children who are raised by their grandparents? Do you have um, books about children who are raised with two fathers? Do you have children that are maybe, for example, adopted by family friends? Um, you guys, Nicole Ritchie. <laughs> she would like that book. <laughs> she should write that book. Um, she was adopted by family friends. Um, and she loves her 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 biological family and she loves her adopted family like she can go into a library she can see herself in the books in the resources in what we have here um, we don't want to again we don't want to take material that makes a caricature out of people's intersection right so you want to be mindful when also selecting for your collections um, you want to also consider multi-intersection groups, right? Um, happens to be a Black child, happens to be a Black child with a disability. Um, but that Black child that happens to be Black, happens to be disabled, 
wants to tell a great story about their experience visiting Disneyland or you know this is how I this is how I spent my summer with grandma you know who is a daredevil and she wanted to go white water rafting <laughs> just throwing ideas out there um, so ask yourself, are multi-intersectional groups reflected in my collection? Uh, you have to, I, you have to, you could, you don't have to, you should uh, look outside of traditional publishing. Consider indie books. Now, my good chat moderator, Katie, already heard my, my soapbox moment. Um, excuses like, Oh, books from independent publishers, self-published books. I don't know if we should add it to our collection because um, we find that they're just not edited properly. Or, uh, you know, there could be a lot of um, just mistakes within the story or they're just not up to par as professionally published stories. As a person who has read a lot of books, <laughs> as a person who has read a lot of professionally published books, we have a lot of garbage out there. <laughs> there's a lot of grammatical errors. Um, there's a lot of just mistakes all around. And there's just horrible writing in general made by people who get professional funding or even advances <laughs> of a million dollars. Let's not mention American dirt. But anyway, we can't use that as an excuse anymore. I refuse. Um, a person who puts their heart and soul in their work and wants to publish independently or wants to publish self-publish because they cannot find somebody to put faith in their work, they'll find an editor that will edit their work properly. You can go and find fabulous, good freelance editors out there and you can get your work edited. Another thing, you as the librarian, you as the collection developer, if you truly cared about really wanting them in your collection, you would take the time to actually read that book. We are all educated professionals. We can work as editors. We can reach out to these authors and say, I would love to add this to my collection, but can you fix these minor grammatical errors? You can be an advocate for these people, for these people that are trying to have their stories heard and deserve a place in our collection, whether or not a Macmillan, a Hatchet, Ingram, I don't know how many publishers out there decides that their work is good enough. We already know that the publishing industry is dominated by white women, white women who got their English degrees, who probably come from well-off families, who probably are not um, interested in pushing any other voices out there because they can sell enough copies by sticking to the status quo. We are not a retail um, institution, organization, at least I don't know. I don't think so. <laughs> if anybody does work in retail, hello. <laughs> so why are we worried about just getting what's popular in the sense of this generates more money, this was on the New York Times bestsellers? You can have that and other things. Go ahead, Katie. Tell me if I'm too preachy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have a comment related to this and then some other questions in the chat that I can share as well, if you want me to, Christina. Yes. Um, so Janine said, this reminds me of the zines presentation given last week. I zines are usually self-published and are often created by individuals that are in the margins slash minorities. It sounded like a great way to provide representation in our libraries. Awesome. And then I have a few questions. Do you want me to share those now or wait till the um, end? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. So Valerie asks, I'm haunted by the knowledge that my daughter in third grade is encountering microaggressions at school that I'll never know about. Do you have any ideas about how to teach those on the receiving end how to cope healthily? 
Right. Um, so when it comes to that, also exposing your child. So me seeking out, again, seeking out books that are the main characters are people who lived my life. So my coworkers can attest. Um, I started working in uh, the pr previous position that I had, and that required me to read some teen fiction. I'm not a huge fan of, of teen fiction. I, I was when I was a teen, but not like not as of late. But just so that I can have, um, so that I can do a review or whatnot, I read a teen fiction book and I picked up um, with the fire on high. And with the fire on high is about a, a Puerto Rican American girl from New York um, that as I was reading, even how they were describing her, how they were describing her relationship with her grandma, her relationship with her friends, her relationship with her teachers at school, everything, it was like they were describing me. How she described, you know, the smells of her cooking and um, ingredients and things like that. It's like I was in the kitchen cooking. And I saw myself in this book. And that is kind of the best advice I can give you is expose your child to people that are like them so that when they are the receivers of microaggression, they're no, they can know, oh, that's just one person's opinion or, oh, that person just doesn't know me, but I do know who knows me. And, you know, it may not be a person that is right next to them because of where they live, but it's definitely in, in the friends that they make through books. Um, my son and daughter are definitely, we live in a very homogenous uh, community and they do, they seek it out in the movies that they read, in the, in the books that they read. My daughter with her lovely lionesque afro, when she saw um, A Wrinkle in Time and the girl trying to navigate, <laughs> navigate the, the, the jumping or whatever it is that they do with that glorious Afro. Um, she loved it. She loved it. She saw herself in it. That's the best advice I can say. Um, definitely, you don't want to um, kind of like come back at the, at the, per the perpetrator of the microaggression negatively because again, and especially if it's a child, they probably aren't aware that they're doing it. It's unconscious. Okay, we had one other comment from Wanda saying, I'm haunted by the library staff that believe this is all a media fabrication and they have an MLS. I wish I knew how to convince them this was real. Yeah. I do know, um, I, was at a, I was at one of the, it, it's a webinar series that the New York Library Association is doing. Um, on racism in libraries and how to combat racism in libraries. And one of the panels at one of the webinars a couple of weeks ago said that there, when it comes to getting up, there's a level of you wanting to know, of you wanting to accept it, that there, there's so much choice in this, that if you encounter librarians or organizations that don't want to, that they choose kind of not to learn or to listen or to accept that these things are real, like that's a whole different other conversation. Like it's not this, everything that I'm discussing with you right now, everything that I'm presenting right now um, are for people who, who may not understand, but want to understand. So there's a level of choice there that we can't force upon anybody, unfortunately. So, um, I already talked about looking outside of traditional publishing. Another thing is think about what you, the librarian, are reading. Um, I can tell you that I've read, I've read a lot of, of too much books <laughs> of predominantly white characters, um, all the Jane Austens and, and uh, so many romance and so many teen books and, you know, that, but ha can you say that you've done the same? You know, you're a person, you know, you're a white male who tends to like action-packed, um, action-packed books, but will you pause for a moment and say, hey, I'm going to 
think about um, a woman's experience and seek out a book that can give you an understanding of that and say, okay, you know, I'm going to take the next six months and read only books written by women about women. Or, um, or are you, again, um, you want to think about a different culture. This is the African American experience. I'm going to go ahead and take six months and I'm only going to read books um, about the African American experience written by African American authors. That's good. That is also going to help you challenge yourself to read something different. Um, diversify your network. Also at one of these webinars with the New York Library Association, they gave this as an as, as a bit of advice. Get to know people from all walks of life. How can you combat implicit bias? How can you open your mind so that you're noticing, oh, maybe I shouldn't say, you know, the word cripple, you know, it's because you're expanding your horizons. You're getting to know people with different abilities. And you, you know, you then would say, well, you know, I know my friend Nathan would not appreciate if I use that word. Um, or I know that, you know, my friend Clara, you know, she doesn't consider herself that because she has, she has, she can do anything that anyone with all their four limbs intact can do. Um, yes, diversify your network. <laughs> um, as librarians, it's so difficult. There's so little, um, so little diversity within librarians as a profession that it, it will be hard for me to say within your organization, you know, connect with your colleagues um, that are diverse. Um, we're looking to change that, right? We want to keep our profession growing. We want to see our profession continue to be diverse. So you can get involved with things like the Diversity Services Roundtable with the ULA, and you can go to conferences and you can talk to students and you can say, yeah, I am gonna take some time and mentor someone that um, is probably questioning what they should do um, after, after college and maybe they wanna pursue an MLS or MLIS. And um, that way you can also get to know the person as a person, you get to know their level of intelligence, their level of passion. Um, you get to see that, 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 that kind of point of view, the framework with which they're coming into the profession is actually invaluable. Um, I have heard it that my um, insight has been really good. <laughs> Don't know how true that is, but I'd like to think that it has because I do see things a little bit differently than a lot of my colleagues. Um, get a LinkedIn account, use that LinkedIn account. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, hey. Um, when the slides are posted, feel free to reach out to me. Now you can say, I know a black librarian in Utah. I'm sure there's like another one of us, isn't there? There's like three of us. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if anyone has any other ideas they would like to share in the chat. But while you do that, I wanna tell you about the Sancocho for the Soul. So if you see the graphic here, this was back in April in the middle of the, of, the, of the quarantine, everybody stay home, um, self-isolate. Uh, this is a um, graphic artist from New York City. Um, he, he's a Dominican, uh, Dominican American. And um, he decided to go ahead and have a great Zoom party. And he called it Sancocho for the Soul, a cozy communal experience. So what happened? We all got the Zoom link and we all were to turn on the video and mute ourselves because he was going to serve as DJ or he had a DJ and he had music going. And if you guys know anyone from the Dominican Republic, we're a lively bunch and a lot of salsa and merengue and just lively, lively music. And everyone had their camera pointed to like what they were cooking in the kitchen. So it was like we were all cooking together from all over the country. <laughs> and it was fabulous. I was dancing in my kitchen. I was chopping the vegetables, chopping everything up. Um, people who know me personally know that I love to cook. 
And um, I was, you know, show, showing everybody, everybody in the chat was hyping everyone else up with, you know, was saying, oh, I know what you're cooking because you pulled out the, you know, you pulled out that seasoning. Oh my gosh, you know, the garlic is coming out. Yay. You know, we were just all, it was just such a joyous thing. So imagine your library taking that very expensive, very expensive Zoom account <laughs> and saying, we're going to use this for our, with our patron. And we're going to have, you know, a virtual book club party. Or we're going to take one hour and have um, all the teens log on and the, the teen librarian is going to show them how to make homemade butterbeer. Or we're going to, you know, present, you know, present something, I don't know, the Harry Potter of, of Asia and like what their thing is or, or there's so much that you can do. <laughs> We can also have a multicultural potluck, virtual potluck. Hey, what are some foods from, from your country from, you know, that you grew up with? Um, you can open it up to the country where, again, we try to say that we're so isolated, but we're not. Um, one of the benefits of technology is that you throw that Zoom link out there, people will find you from all over the country. Um, he's in New York, I'm all the way here. I found him just fine. I was there. Um, Three o'clock my time. Go ahead, Katie. Oh, we ran out of time. <laughs> I'm not done. <laughs> yep, I was just giving you a time warning real quick. <laughs> so <laughs> I will jump back up. <laughs> so sorry, so sorry. So anyway, so um, there's some ideas. Um, I'm sure you guys have other ideas. I apologize, I didn't get to it. I just go on and on. Um, just, you know, what have we learned? I refer us back to our takeaways page. Um, defining implicit bias, um, understanding that most of the time it's unintentional, but we can definitely take, take time to, you know, self-assess, um, go deep within ourselves and say, you know what, I would like to be more aware. I want to be a better librarian. I do want to adhere to the core values um, of librarianship. Uh, one last thing I want to leave you with are the, roles, uh, the words of Dr. Nicole Amy Cook, Professor of Information Sciences at University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. She says, diversity is not a trend, it is an imperative, and developing services and collections for diverse populations should be at the forefront of every library's priorities. We, Utah, we are a great bunch. We can do this. And thank you so much for your time. The slides will be posted. Um, definitely visit the ULA.org. Check out the Diversity um, Services Roundtable for more resources. I added resources to the end of the slides. You can download the slides later on. Thank you, thank you, thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you, Christina. That was wonderful. Really, really great.